Hi, my name is Megan Beaton. I'm a visiting assistant professor of Canadian history at, West, at Western Washington University in Bellingham, Washington, which is located on the lands of the Coast Salish peoples. Today, I'll speak with you about Canada's 1967 centennial celebrations. 1967 marked 100 years of confederation and the birth of the modern Canadian state. That year, Canada publicly commemorated this national event through programs intended to celebrate this anniversary. Canada's 1967 celebrations are etched in popular memory as a time of overwhelming optimism about the country's future. The sentiment is reflected in popular works by authors who have written about the year. Pierre Burton, for example, described 1967 as, quote, the last good year, when Canada indulged in folk dancing, historical pageants, parades, and youth exchanges. Jack Granatstein stated that the year revealed a swinging with it nation. And J.M. Bumstead notes that the country had come of age as Canadians got the spirit by participating in exuberant displays of national pride. So how was 1967 marked? Well, many of the public celebrations were directed by the National Centennial Commission out of Ottawa. The Commission's mandate was to promote the centennial and plan anniversary programming and events. It also worked to ensure that Canadians and communities right across the country had the opportunity to participate in all commemorative events. But in order to fulfill this mandate, to reach out to all Canadians, the Commission needed money, and money it got. Ottawa armed the Commission with an arsenal of millions of dollars to spend on the national celebration. Between 1963 and 1967, the Commission funneled $200 million, about $1.5 billion in 2016 dollars, into 1967 programming. This amount of money spent on cultural initiatives was unprecedented in the country's history. Indeed, historian Jonathan Vance argues that the government's investment and the money spent on 1967 projects and programming was the high water mark of government support for culture in Canada. The government funding of 1967 activities was seen as an important step in supporting cultural projects and events right across Canada. In a series of speeches about the centennial, Canada's Secretary of State Maurice Lamontagne noted that 1967 was an opportune time to launch a campaign against what he called the country's cultural poverty. Lamontagne argued that Canada had made considerable material and physical progress since Confederation. But he noted that not all sectors of society had kept pace. Cultural infrastructure development was far from where it should be. And he argued that the country had failed to invest in cultural and heritage activities. The solution was to support Canadian culture through centennial programming and projects across the country. So what were these projects? Well, let me tell you about a few of them. Funds were spent on everything from supporting local infrastructure projects all the way through to national events. Youth travel, for example, was one of the Commission's most popular programs. Between 1964 and 1967, over 40,000 high school students went on week-long community exchanges to experience life in a completely different region of the country. The program aimed to give high school students an understanding of the social and economic conditions under which the nation was developing at the time. The goal was to have the students return to their home communities, broadened in outlook, enriched in mind and spirit, and with a vastly increased knowledge and understanding of Canada and its peoples. This program was praised in the press for engaging the country's youth in 1967 festivities. It was an initiative that, in the words of one journalist, would, quote, open many windows and doors to invite the fresh air of national breeze and strengthen national unity. Another program that the Commission funded was called Community Improvement and Beautification. It was an environmental program that encouraged citizens to clean up 
what the Commission called Canada's outdoor living room. It encouraged citizens to participate in programs like downtown cleanups and anti-litter programs and even to plant flowers and trees in their communities. These efforts would clean up landscapes and result in what the Commission called a better Canadian way of life. And so ultimately, this program encouraged citizens to take part in collective community efforts as a meaningful way to participate in 1967. One other popular commemorative initiative was the Confederation train that traveled across Canada. It featured exhibits about the country's history. The train welcomed visitors with a whistle that sounded the opening lines of O Canada. And over 2.5 million Canadians visited the train during its 63 stops across the country. But some of this 1967 programming operated in such a way that presented a very particular version of Canadian history and Canadian identity. Much of this programming was based on what's been called the bicultural history of Canada. This history focused on the idea of, quote, two founding nations. That is, in other words, a lot of 1967 programming focused on the contributions of the British and the French in creating the Canadian nation. This emphasis on a bicultural history of Canada was used in part to try and quell the rise of separatism in Quebec that was taking off during the 1960s. But what was the problem with this particular version of history? Well, the emphasis on the idea of Canada's two founding nations is that it expunged the histories of Aboriginal peoples. In other words, much of the 1967 programming ignored Aboriginal people's histories. The result was that programming was often framed within a colonial and a settler context. For example, Maceo Dean has looked at the history of the Centennial Voyager canoe pageant. That event saw groups travel by canoe from Rocky Mountain Horse House in Alberta all the way through to Montreal, Quebec for Expo 67. Dean argues that this event erased Aboriginal histories and ignored issues of Aboriginal sovereignty from the narrative and the stories that were told through this event. Similarly, Pearl Ann Reichwing has looked at the history of the Yukon Alpine Centennial Expedition. It was a mountaineering project that added to long-standing mythologies about Canada's north. In particular, the event ignored the fact that Aboriginal peoples had lived on the continent since time immemorial. And these are issues that we need to consider when thinking about how the history of Canada and Canadian identities have been told and imagined. I want to end by saying a few words about community projects. One of the Commission's most enduring legacies was called the Centennial Grants Program. That program helped communities build projects such as art galleries, community centers, parks, swimming pools, archives, skating rinks, museums, recreation areas, and libraries. Over 2,600 projects were built across Canada, all of which became long-standing and enduring reminders of 1967. Projects had a plaque with the 1967 symbol, which you see behind me. It was a stylized maple leaf with 11 triangles, one for each province and one for the territories. Under the Centennial Grants Program and other funding sources, the government provided massive funding for local, provincial, and national museums as well. It's difficult to emphasize how important this 1967 money was for Canadian museums. It was nothing short of dramatically expanding the country's cultural landscape. In 1967, provincial museums were built in Alberta, British Columbia, and the Yukon. Canada's national museums also received funding to help tell Canadian stories. The National Museum of Man, which is now called the Canadian Museum of History, and the Museum of Science and Technology received funds to expand their programming and their exhibits. In addition, many local museums received funding to tell the stories and the histories of their communities and their peoples. This growth in the number of museums through government funding 
was one of the ways that the state realized its ambitious 1967 agenda to improve the country's cultural life. These sites expanded heritage, commemoration, and memorial activities that fundamentally changed the place of history in the public's consciousness. And the Canadian public flocked to these museums. Their popularity reflected the country's history and that it was worth celebrating and interrogating. Now, to be sure, museums in the 1960s did not tell everyone's stories. For example, there was little content about Aboriginal people's histories, other than to note that they were there at the time of contact. Women's history was not prominently featured, nor was labor or working class histories. The state's unprecedented support for museums, heritage sites, and commemorative activities changed the very face of the country's cultural activities. All of a sudden, there was money for museums and a public that was hungry to learn about its history. This was not surprising, given that 1967 was intended to look back and celebrate what had happened in the country over the previous 100 years. I hope that this talk has introduced you to some of the history of Canada's 1967 centennial. Thanks for listening.